Okay. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, I'm Li Chen from Hong Kong Baptist University. So I'm the chair of this keynote session. Uh, We're very pleased to, uh, to have uh, Dr. Michelle Zhou, uh, who will give us this keynote. That is, uh, you really get me conversational AI agents that can truly understand and help users. So please allow me to first introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Michelle Zhou. So Dr. Michelle Zhou is a co-founder and the CEO of Juji, uh, which is an AI uh, startup company uh, specializing in building AI technologies and backing such technologies into easy to use solutions that enables the creation and uh, adoption of responsible uh, and empathetic uh, uh, artificial intelligence agents. And before uh, starting Juji, Michelle had uh, led the user systems and experience research group at IBM Research uh, um, uh, Madden and then the IBM Watson Group. And Michelle's uh, expertise is mainly in the interdisciplinary area of intelligent user interaction, including conversational AI systems and personality analytics. And she is also an inventor of the IBM Watson Personality Insights and has led the research and development of at least a dozen products in her area of expertise. Uh, so she is currently the editor in chief of ACM Transactions on Interactive Intelligent Systems and an associate editor of uh, ACM Transactions on Intelligent Systems and Technology. So without further ado, so please, so welcome uh, Dr. Michelle Zhou to give us this keynote. Thank you, Michelle. Lee, thank you very much for your introduction. Can you see my screen right now, Lee? Maybe you can be my- yeah, I can see it. Great, you can see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, great. Hello everyone, thank you for being here, especially for those on the US coast. It's uh, 7 a.m. in the morning. Good morning to you and a good evening too other folks uh, in another regime. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And I'm pretty sure many of you have already interacted with the conversational AI before, such as uh, uh, Amazon, Alexa, or Google Home. And today I'm going to talk about it is how can we make a conversational AI that can deeply understand users and help users. And here is a quick outline of my uh, today's talk. Um, so let's start with uh, a brief motivation and quickly then a live demo. So in the past few years, we have seen there's a surge of activities in what's called the conversational commerce. As you can see from the numbers on the right, a majority of the consumers today are already using uh, a text-based conversational interface to either learn about the product or service, to make a purchase, or to get support. That's because conversational interfaces provide the convenience, personalization, and decision support on demand. And moreover, the conversational interface, it's a very natural and a private way for users to receive recommendations. As you can see from my this is a kind of a screenshot, during a conversation, it is very natural for our system to elicit a user's needs and wants, and then offer our personalized guidance or help. So now I would like to actually share a quick demo where a conversational agent helps two users actually differently. So I'm, I'm switching the screen to the Chrome right now. So what I want you to pay attention to this demo is that um, uh, I start with uh, uh, kind of like, a, basically it's the same chatbot, it's the same conversational AI, but I want to show that how it helps the two different users. So the first one I show it is from uh, Facebook Messenger uh, entrance. So if I say hello, right, so this kind of started this one. So I will point out where you want to pay attention to. Um, then I will say, where are we? Oh, I said it. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure how easy for you to see the text. That, so I'm typing right now. It is, uh, could you recommend some cars for me to consider? And the chat bot said, I'd be glad to help, right? So then we asked me what kind of car. I said, I'd be interested in SUV. And then they asked me whether I have a price constraints. I said, uh, under what is that, Okay, so what kind of a cars coming out is not the key point. The key point here, I want to point out it is, uh, look at the wording here, right? So uh, the wording here it is, uh, you seem loving high quality items and finer things. I'd like to recommend two cars under 40,000. So here I want to point out it is uh, not just uh, the, not only does the chatbot uh, gets uh, some of the constraints, explicit constraints, uh, such as uh, SUV and 40, under $40,000, but also somehow understands my internal, maybe implicit, uh, intrinsic needs in terms of having a high quality product. So in this case, if I say, what's my shopper DNA, for example. So this is one type of the, uh, basically characterize the shopper's needs, if you will. So basically the person's goal oriented and make decisions based on career and family, which means they also likes prestige, likes actually high quality products and brand named products. So in contrast, I want to show another one, actually. Uh, so this is the one for different, totally different account, but it's actually the same chatbot, right? So I want to go inside basically to show the, uh, the different uh, uh, conversation of it. Another full, full screen, you can see my probably typing easier. So in this case, I, did, I said it is, uh, so I'm looking for a new car, any recommendations? I'd be glad to help, I have a couple quick questions. So this one is very similar and basically still get some of the explicit constraints that's easy to specify. So then I said it is, uh, I want a hatchback. Okay. Again, uh, the, the car is coming up, right? But I want you to pay attention to the wording the chatbot is using. So chatbot using here, it is uh, from our chat, you seem a thoughtful person and stressing the real value of a product. So in this case, it's a very different, right? So I wanted to show you uh, just quickly, then I go back. So we have something called uh, uh, shopper DNA messages. So which is matches with this case for this person is called the value shopper. So value shopper, as you can see here, it is they are very cautious and they prefer big well-known brands and also very traditional. So they really value the durability and the actually, uh, which is the price in terms of one, in terms of a product when they're choosing products, right? So you will see the two demos I want to show here. It's a very quick demo to show it is uh, uh, even though they gave a very explicit constraints, but the systems trying to also infer their implicit needs, their implicit constraints. So now I'm going back to show you, so how can we make that happen? So uh, uh, let me go back oh, here. Now you have seen the demo. So uh, next, let's go behind the scene to see what actually happens. 
So at a very high level, this is what's behind the scene. Uh, the conversational AI you just saw is driven by two engines. So one engine is called uh, basically conversational engine that uh, takes the user text input uh, and interprets it and outputs system responses. In parallel, there's another engine it's called the personal insights inference engine, which takes all the text that the user has been uh, given and automatically infer the personality traits from the user. So then the inferred traits can be used for personalized recommendation. And today for rest of the talk, I'm gonna be um, focusing on personal insights inference. But before we get into the, before getting to the technical aspect of it, I wanted to actually answer two simple questions first. The first question is, what is personality? Because uh, different people have a different uh, types of uh, uh, definitions. So I want to just uh, clarify here what we define personality. So personality by our definition, so by probably most of a traditional psychology definition is uh, individual differences. It includes a set of psychological characteristics that define people as, as unique individuals. And these characteristics actually uh, describe a person mainly from three aspects. So the first aspect is that they can describe what a person likes to do, such as, as a person's passion and interests. The second aspect is they describe what a person is good at. This is such as the person's talents and skills. And the last aspect is talking about uh, how a person handles life's challenges. This is uh, talking about such a person's uh, social intelligence and emotional intelligence. Then the next question is very natural. Why personality, especially in the context of recommender systems? Rec recommender systems. And uh, there are several reasons. The first reason it is, uh, as you can see earlier in the demo, I'm pretty sure you have experienced in, your real, in the real life as well. Uh, in many cases, users may not be able to articulate their needs explicitly. For example, I'm looking for a financial plan or maybe you're looking for a retirement plan. I don't really know what kind of plan might best suit my needs. So in this case, if you know uh, personality, of the personality of the user, because personality drives a person's internal motivations and needs, then you could actually, that information can be used for recommendation. And the second part of it, the interesting part of it is uh, people do change, so, are, so is their personality. So in this case, it is, uh, if you can know people's personality, you can also track in the changing needs of a person. So which means for these reasons, uh, it's very useful to understand and to acquire a user's personality. And the second problem, probably is a more technical problem, is a code star problem, which many of you are very familiar with. This is just the purely be because the due to a lack of data and the systems couldn't really infer about the user's preferences and choices and make sensible recommendations. So on another side, if we knew a user's personality, and then for example, some we knew somebody who is creative, meticulous, or family oriented. Not only does the a system will know the likes and dislikes of this person, it can really make recommendations based on this implicit and internal motivations. So for example, in this case, if somebody knew this one, it can actually recommend the different types of career choices, entertainment options, healthcare plans, as well as the financial plans. And actually, um, uh, many of the research, including actually this, I think I'm pretty for this uh, recent work from a Lee group, who actually already shown that uh, incorporating personality traits of users in a recommender systems, the recommender system can perform better, even including in code start situations. Now coming to the key question. So how can we infer or how can we obtain personality traits of users? So traditionally, uh, the approaches that have been used is called item-based surveys. 
So I'm pretty sure many of you have taken some kind of a personality test. So in this type of approach, it is uh, each user will get a certain, uh, basically a set of items, right? Then they can rate themselves, self-rated, uh, self-rate themselves basically on those items uh, on a numerical scale. But this approach, even though it has been used for many, many years, uh, it has uh, several major drawbacks. The first drawback it is uh, uh, those items normally are designed or uh, come up by the psychologists in the lab. So they try to be very generic, but in the meantime, they're context insensitive. Just thinking about this item, I love children, right? So for, for the people who haven't thought about having children, who haven't experienced having children, it's very hard for them to assess, uh, evaluate themselves on, on this particular item. And the second part of the problem it is scale subjectivity. So for example, my five love, love children scale five probably is very different than the uh, five scale of at uh, least I love children. Maybe it's very different than a five scale of other people's, uh, their self-rating I love children. And the last one is even more problematic. This type of surveys are very easy to subject to faking, especially due to social desirability reasons. So for example, just thinking about it, honestly, in real life, how many people under, a, especially under the high stakes circumstances, they will be very honestly to say they're cheating on taxes. So as you can see, there are kind of a drawbacks of the existing or traditional psychometric assessments. And then uh, what's come to rescue it is uh, research in uh, psycholinguistics has shown that uh, uh, a person's communication patterns, especially in verbal communication, the type of words they use, how the words is being used can indicate the person's personality or other type of psychological characteristics. So based on this finding, and there is a number of approaches that have been developed uh, to actually automatically derive personality traits from, a pers from people's uh, uh, basically um, uh, communication text. But all these approaches share a very similar paradigm. So what happens here it is uh, you ask the set of the users to take the personality test, as I mentioned earlier, then you obtain their 30 personality survey scores. Then you collect their text data and then you do regression model, build regression models so trying to figure out uh, what type of uh, text features can be used to predict uh, the surveyed personality scores. So here is an example. So using the regression models, for example, your Yorkoni's work has shown that uh, certain word categories, this is from a loop dictionary categories, that's such as the first person plural, second person, and also numbers, uh, can help predict whether a person is extrovert or not. So, the, so then once you have this coefficient, then you can actually compute uh, the trait scores from a text. So I, I cited our old work uh, back at IBM Watson. This is kind of a, you can come up with different types of algorithm and manipulate the use of the coefficients and also the use of the word features. So the major drawback here it is this, approach still has not actually addressed the fundamental problems I mentioned earlier, the traditional psychometric assessment, because it relies on self-rated, self-reported surveys. So because of these drawbacks, we started to looking at a totally different approach, but it's still based on the modern psychometrics. So in modern psychometrics, there is an approach called latent trait theory is also known as item response theory. So this theory actually on the surface, it's very uh, easy to understand. So it models every trait as a latent factor and those items as observed evidence. So in this case, you can use this evidence to infer the latent traits. But the problem with this traditional approach of the IRT or classic IRT is that uh, the items are still coming from the labs, as I mentioned earlier. So they're still being taken by the people on the self-report, self-evaluation. So to improve this method, so what we did it is 
uh, created the, what we call the generalized item response theory. So in this case, what happened here is uh, instead of asking people to self-rate the items, to obtain the item scores, basically observing the item scores that evidence, we automatically extract the items from user's behavior. So in this case, you can really generalize, right? So from a, if the behavior, it's a communication behavior from a text, then you can uh, identify the potential items uh, such as uh, the word uh, used, the phrase used, the sentences, uh, the punctuation marks, uh, as well as even emoticons uh, or, certain, or certain syntactic structures. Then you can use that uh, to model the latent traits. So which means it is uh, you establish some mathematical function of the, be uh, basically the, the mathematical function of the behavior and becomes your latent traits. So here, I want to give you a specific example of using the text. So consider this observed uh, data X contains the N pieces of evidences. So this evidence could be very small, like one word use, and it could be also a phrase, and it could be also sentence, right? So depends on the granularity, you can decide on that, but you can actually learn this from the training data. So, uh, mu here would be the occurrence rate of the evidence, and lambda here is the discriminative power of the evidence J to trade theta. So theta is the one we want to model. It's a latent factor, basically. So here, what happened here is consider the conditional distribution of X for theta. Then you can estimate the parameters in uh, this formula. Of course, you can also come up with a different formula as well. And in this case, you can use the various algorithms, uh, for example, such as an EM algorithm over the training data to infer uh, these uh, actually parameters, right? So in this case, uh, given a set of uh, text, then you can infer uh, people's uh, trade scores. So, so far we have been focusing on inferring uh, trade scores for a big five personality models. So big five personality model includes the five dimensions as I shown here, openness, neuroticism, agreeableness, extroversion, and conscientiousness. Also under each model, you have a six sub dimensions. So our current uh, computation basically infers uh, 35 trade scores uh, given a set of the text for a person. And you might be asking why big five personality model because it's the most uh, no model, and more importantly, in psychology, especially in modern psychology, numerous studies have shown that uh, big five personality traits uh, can really predict uh, users' real world behavior. And some of you probably have heard about uh, Myers Briggs model, but you talk to psychologists about that, they will ask you not to use it because uh, few studies have shown those traits uh, can predict uh, users' uh, real world behavior. This is also next to my next actually uh, set of slides talking about this, how you evaluate the goodness of the model, especially the computational inference model. And before we're doing that, I want to say a few words about uh, once you have the basic personality traits, what can you do about it? So use that model. Now you can infer users' implicit needs in different domains for different applications. So this is coming back to my demo. So my demo actually I showed the two, almost two personality profiles of the users. One is the value shopper, which they value the actually the really the value from price and durability and proven product. And the achiever model, which means they value their internal needs is premium products and prestige and the finer things. But if you look at underneath, there is a composition of their personality traits infer this type of needs. So for example, for the value shopper, they have a high on intellectual curiosity, but they're also very cautious, very cautious and very dutiful. And in contrast, achiever model underneath of it is the achievement striving because they're very, also very confident in assertiveness. And also they have artistic interests and they share uh, intellectual curiosity. So many studies have shown that uh, underlying the five personality traits uh, can be composed to infer 
different types of user needs. And here is another example about the user's entertainment needs. I also gave two examples of the two types of needs. So one type of needs is called aesthetic needs. Another type of needs called the cerebral needs. So aesthetic needs is composed of the imagination, artistic interest, intellectual curiosity, while the cerebral needs is, contains the self-discipline and cautiousness and intellectual curiosity. So as you can see here is because of a different needs, they really desire different products or different types of services. So from music point of view, aesthetic needs the desires more classic music and the cerebral actually doesn't even have this one. And the aesthetic for the, they like art books, they like arts and humanities TV programs, independent films, and the cerebral likes more business books and the business economy type of programs for TV and the documentary films because they have a shared intellectual curiosity. So we can see they have a shared needs on films on documentary films. So now I come into a very important aspect of it is, so how do you know your model actually is good? So in psychometric, if you do some any of the measurements, there are two, type, two dimensions that you have to evaluate your model on. So one dimension is reliability. So this is kind of like you design a scale, right? You weigh yourself every day. But if the scale is not very good, you weigh yourself today, it's let's say 120 pounds. Tomorrow, you weigh yourself is 500 pounds, which means this scale is really horrible. It's not very stable. So similarly, in this personality assessment, you want your measurement, your inference to be very reliable, which means it is given a certain amount of data for a person, if you randomly sample this data, the infer the results should be within a similar range of each other, right? So that's called reliability. So in psychometric, what do you do reliability here? As you can see here, this is an example of the big five extroversion dimension reliability score we have done over, I think about 250,000 maybe people. So in this case, it is, you can see here it is, if you sample 100 words, so the Cronbox alpha, would not reach 0 0.8, some of them, most of them, uh, some of them reach above 0 0.8. So in psychometrics, if you reach 0 0.8, which means the, the indicates accept, acceptable stability. So let me give you a little bit of analogy on this one. So if you text your, uh, if you actually, uh, uh, in this case it is, if you take a personality test twice, same person, uh, or maybe a couple of times. So the results from your personality test normally will reach the crumb box alpha between 0 0.76 to 0 0.83 because the humans are known to be inconsistent. So once you are above 0 0.8, which means your instrument, it's, a, it's relatively reliable. So as you can see here it is, if you have a thousand words of a person, the majority of the dimensions above 0 0.8, but except for one dimension, I think it's a cheerfulness dimension, then you have to reach over 2,000 words in order to reach 0 0.8. But the nice feature about that can see here it is, uh, if you have a lot of evidence for a person, potentially you can potentially reach one, which means it's stabilized. But a human can never do that because uh, humans are known to be inconsistent, so which means it is uh, the computers can consistently can um, reliably identify the evidence and uh, to, to infer the characteristics of a person reliably. And another interesting one you might be asking it is, uh, humans are also known to be very imaginative, right? So now you use my conversational text to infer my personality, can I cheat on you? Which means I cheat on this AI, right? Can I disguise myself? So this is actually a very interesting study came out in uh, 2020s from a German group, I think in Munich Technology University, or oh, I'm sorry if I misread the university. So basically what they did is uh, they created uh, chatbots on our platform. And then they asked people, first one, to use the chatbot to get their personality profile and uh, just a normal way. And then they actually incentivized the participants uh, 
to trick the chatbots, which means pretend them are not themselves, right? Basically to say something normally they don't say, to trick the chatbot, to see if they can disguise themselves. Actually, it turned out it's very difficult. And the participants also found out the process is very exhausting. Basically, try to pretend and not themselves. And actually, the results, it's very, uh, how to say, uh, uh, very little, not so much variations from their real profile. So it means it's very hard to trade. This also means from another way to say this, uh, our inference, uh, it's relatively reliable because uh, once the person starting to do this one, certain very small evidences, maybe the humans couldn't detect it, but the machine can detect it and still can identify the similar traits from the usage of their uh, communication, from their communication behavior, from the usage of their or, uh, uh, text or basically the uh, uh, ling uh, ling uh, linguistic text, right? So the second part of it is called the validity. So validity is talking about it is how useful the inferred traits are. So usefulness, which means it is, as I mentioned earlier, why big five is well known and it's most used. It's because of their usefulness in a way it is uh, to predict uh, users' uh, real world behavior. So uh, other groups have used our work, uh, have done some of agility. Agility is a little bit difficult to do because it's normally context uh, dependent and context sensitive. So in this case, it shows that uh, this is from a university and uh, from a university, they wanted to use uh, the, 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 you use the chatbot to interview the students and they wanted to use the derived personality traits to predict uh, the student project the team performance and the team harmony, also along with other kind of a team properties, team attributes. So they also asked the students to take traditional surveys as well. So they took the chapa, they took the surveys. And the interesting enough to find out it is uh, from a chatbot, uh, the emotional variance of the team, which means from their emotional characteristics inferred by the chatbot, uh, can be used to predict their team performance uh, uh, very well. And similarly, the similar uh, another type of traits called the emotional sensitivity of the team can predict the team harmony, which means how many how much conflict among the team members they have, right? And also interesting finding it is none of them self-reported survey uh, scores can predict team performance. And, and team harmony because uh, we're, so one of our uh, hypotheses is that uh, because uh, during this kind of self-reported one, because everybody wants to be uh, a good player, wants to be, uh, what, wants to portray themselves uh, as a good team member. So they didn't really, they're not very truthful to themselves. But when they talk to the chat about it, they are much more truthful, much more actually true to themselves. To actually uh, reveal their own, their true personality, their true actually needs and wants. That's why they can predict uh, their team performance and team actually harmony. And there's another study. This is about uh, gamers. So this study interviews about uh, 282 gamers uh, about uh, 12 minutes. I think the uh, previous study they interviewed. Uh, uh, the students longer at Chapa is around uh, maybe 30 minutes, 30 to 35 minutes. This is about 12 minutes. So uh, at the end of the interview, the chatbot actually uh, tells uh, the interview, told every gamer their gamer DNA also recommend a game to them. So then they ask the gamer to rate uh, on the recommended game, basically how much they agree to it. So for example, complete nonsense or they absolutely would actually take a look at the game, you uh, play the game, right? So then it's on the scale of one to five. So the mean was uh, uh, 4.55 and the standard division 0.65. So this also shows that uh, even with the short uh, conversation and the chatbot, the conversational AI was still able to infer the gamers, uh, gamer DNA in this case, uh, and uh, provide uh, sensible recommendations uh, within a short period of time of the interaction. This is another way of validating uh, the inferred uh, characteristics uh, uh, by the uh, conversational AI. So next one, I want to quickly to point out the several applications because now you could uh, 
automatically infer a user's uh, characteristics on the fly during the conversation, it opens so many opportunities for recommender system, building different types of recommender systems. So uh, uh, from uh, our own experience, it is that we have seen the usage in from healthcare to education to workplace team, you already say, and also from human capital management in terms of job interviews and also uh, entertainment, of course, right? So I wanted to talk about from, from a mundane example to some of the examples which you normally uh, recommend their systems that I haven't seen doing a lot. So um, uh, many of you I know from Pandora or maybe from Spotify, and uh, when you do music recommendation, the traditional approach is to rely a lot about the user item relationships. Assuming we don't have any user item relationships, what can you do? So if you can use our Algorithm, similar, our algorithm, similar type of inference uh, to infer the music's personality. Because in this case, uh, because the music personality you can infer from the lyrics or from even people's uh, reviews. So you give a piece of music a personality. Then you can match that personality with uh, the user's personality. Because we don't have really a music, we have done this one with the books, which it turns out to be very successful as well. So you have a book personality and it matches with the uh, user personality. But when you add additional data, like their, for example, their history of reading other books or something, of course, it wouldn't make recommendations much better. But as a starting point, you can jumpstart the recommendation right away. And because now you can apply the similar algorithm to both sides, the item side as well as the user side. Another very interesting recommendation, recommendation is talking about it is uh, 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 talking about review recommendations. So whenever I go to the review sites, let's say TripAdvisor or maybe Amazon, the interesting part of here it is uh, when you look at the so many reviews, you don't want to, you don't know which one to look at. So for my cases, I always ask it is uh, I wanted to look at the reviews written by the people who are like me. So it's the birds of feather flock together, right? This is uh, kind of like a traditional wisdom. So in this case, it is uh, instead of just uh, recommend the reviews, so you can actually figure out the personality traits of the reviewers and then match that reviewers with the readers. So in this case, it is, uh, again, you can, from the personality side of it, to uh, figure out uh, which review might be most useful for the uh, readers, for the users. And another interesting one is talking about your guiding actually recommendation presentation. Let's assume that uh, uh, these two people actually get uh, the same set of items because uh, based on their hardcore constraints, uh, a price constraints, a type constraints, uh, they got the same set of them. But uh, the presentation of the recommendation can be very different uh, depending on their personality. So for example, if one is very assertive, impatient, uh, another one is very meticulous, indecisive, in this case, uh, you might want to show the overview of the impatient one and then the detail of the, uh, basically summarize the recommendation items and then and to list the items one by one. And from, uh, for another person who is meticulous and decisive, and you might want to point out the facts, the differences, the comparison facts first uh, before listing the items. So as you can see, actually I forgot to um, cite a paper recently we published talking about the use this uh, even to present analytics information to different users based on their um, personality. And you can even recommend the different type of analytics mechanisms, for example, either do a comparison versus doing a, a aggregated analysis. Okay, so I think I'm, um, um, I still have about five minutes, I guess. Uh, so um, I wanted to leave something for you uh, to think about it. So now, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the conversational AI, such as the ones we're developing, can really understand a user deeply. And a user actually has a hard time to hide from it. So we will often say it is uh, with the great power coming with the great responsibilities. So how can you can make it, because the system now knows so much about the user, so how can you make sure that the AI is responsible? So let's say, for example, 
uh, especially in the commercial world, that if the AI already knew the person, it's very much like to be indulged in the game playing. Is going to seduce them to play more games? Are you going to prevent them from being become more addiction uh, uh, to a deep into their game addiction? So how can you make sure the AI responsibility? And the second part is interesting. Recently, we have seen papers coming out. I think this is Shlomo's paper I cited. It's uh, you can use other extra signals to infer people's personality. For example, physiological signals or their image uh, behavior, right? My image what they like uh, and what images they actually pictures they take. And also from their video behavior. For example, I'm talking right now. If you, my talk is recorded, can I analyze my talk actually uh, just by even a, a visual behavior and to infer my personality. So the use of a mix of the data. Another part is about evaluations. This is very important as well. And it becomes harder and harder. And you probably couldn't imagine how much time I have to use for the very two small demos in the one. It's not because of how hard to make a chapa. It's very hard to find a user which has demonstrated different personality, right? So you want to test your recommender systems, especially based on people's intrinsic properties. And how can you find so many people? Uh, and how can you do the evaluation systematically, hopefully automatically? So this is actually one of the biggest problem bothers us right now. And especially uh, in the conversational field, and you cannot afford to actually do this manually anymore because you can't test all the different conversational uh, variations and to test the different personalities. So it becomes a, a very hard problem. So then I wanted to actually go to a, a quick summary here. So what I presented here it is uh, now with the uh, today's approaches, uh, you could really make a conversational AI systems uh, super smart uh, at understanding the intrinsic uh, motivations, intrinsic needs, uh, and the unique characteristics uh, of each user. We call it the read between the lines. And then you can use such information to hyper-personalize the interaction in terms of recommending products, even recommending actually be changing of a behavior, just thinking about it. You can use that actually to help people, train people in terms of uh, their behavior and uh, help them develop their personality traits. So there's that uh, opens up an uh, incredible, amount, incredible amount of opportunity, new opportunities for developing a new generation of recommender systems, of course, new generation of a conversational AI systems as well. So having said this one, I wanted to actually thank my colleagues who uh, we made this, uh, uh, actually our conversational AI system um, ha uh, happen. And also, especially I want to acknowledge my co-founder, Hua Hai, who is a psychologist and also computer scientist. Uh, the, his brilliant work of using uh, actually generalized the IRT theory to infer personality traits. And also I want to thank all our collaborators as well uh, in this endeavor and our uh, sponsors from um, uh, the AFOSR and also DOD and also the uh, Digital X Partners as our actually financial sponsor for many of our projects. Uh, okay, I think uh, I wanted to point out one, doing one actually uh, and, uh, publicity. So actually, the coming new the new issue for TIS is SEM. Uh, actually, it's new issue talking about data driven personality modeling for interactive intelligence systems. So for some of you who are interested in this area, you might want to check out the papers. It's a set of papers that you're talking about the different ways uh, using data to infer personality traits uh, uh, from users from user behavior, basically. So that would. Uh, I uh, encourage you, of course, to submit uh, to this journal as well. And we have a special issue just to call for papers the next year for conversational AI for healthcare and for wellness. So thank you all for staying here. And um, maybe I can take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle, for this very interesting talk. So as I see, there are already a number of questions posted in Hova. Uh, so maybe I read out and so I invite you to answer. Sure, so, thank you, Lee. Yeah. Okay. 
so I think the first question maybe already addressed in your slides, that is how are the shoppers' DNA personas defined, predefined by rules system or learned from data? Can they adapt to different business domains? A good po yeah, good point. So currently we do two ways, right? So very first, uh, if we don't have enough data, we would use a rule-based approach to compose the underlying personality traits based on empirical results. So empirical results, they have many empirical results to show the basically the coefficients, how the personality traits predict the different types of needs, like a shopper's needs. Once we have that, that's also our jump start. You can think about that's our baseline. Then we learn through the real data. So for example, then you use conversational AI to actually recommend the products. And from there, you can refine. So for example, the, uh, the DNA for entertainment, that's how we did it. We at the beginning, we had this very empirical way, rule-based. Then we train them on their, uh, using a, a basically book recommendation. So we have uh, thousands of people coming, book recommendation. And again, based on end results, we kind of refine our models. So they can, So this is going back to the question saying that, uh, can you actually use it, uh, reuse it for different domains? The answer is yes, but you can further improve it if you use the domain data to further refine the model. That's I, that's, that's I said, like for example, the you know, entertainment, right? So you can use the version, something very quickly at the beginning, and then you can use the real world uh, user behavior to, fight, to further improve that, refine the model. And it then becomes much easier, much faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And also some uh, audience are a little concerned about the user's privacy and also some filter bubble issues. For example, one question is, what about the privacy of users handled when designing these types of systems? A very uh, a great question. So I was talking about, I think my slides still on the responsibilities. So this is very important. So when other clients are using our systems, we always give them a, what we call it, um, a best practice. So first one, don't pretend uh, uh, this is a person, right? Just say this is the AI system. And also second one, to be very transparent, to tell people what uh, your system can do for them and ask people's permissions as well. For example, we had a paper, I think in 2015 and 2014 in Kai, talking about it is asking people's preference about uh, uh, how willing they are sharing their, how willing they are to share their personality, infer the personality traits, right? So it really depends on the use. If they feel like this uh, sharing could help, when I say sharing, that means sharing to everybody, right? It means sharing with the system and to use it, that information to make recommendations. I would say, I think the results, uh, most of the users are very willing to use that. But however, they want to protect it and not to share them with others. So for example, uh, one user come in to uh, use their personality traits to get recommendations for entertainment choices. They don't want to share this with, let's say a job interviewer if they don't want to, right? So this one we made very clear, uh, our policy made it very clear it is, uh, it has to be needs users permission uh, to uh, share uh, if the user has basically opt in their their preferences and their permission to do to do so. Okay, thank you. And on, uh, another uh, question, also two related questions. So, which are both about the filter bubble issues. So, uh, one is do consider filter bubble issues that might come from the personality based recommendations. Another is, uh, don't you think that uh, uh, such a fixed mapping between personality traits and preferences may lead to increased echo chambers. Yeah, it seems that people would be exposed to the same items, such as documentaries. Yeah, very great, uh, uh, a great question. So uh, this is a double-edged sword, right? So if you knew the person so much, uh, do you want them to the, so this is the echo chamber, right? So do you want to create a potential biases for the recommendation as well? So let's say if you knew I am very uh, creative, 
So you keep showing me the creative things. And uh, then uh, that's what I'm kind of stuck into that uh, uh, bubble, right? And so this is a kind of a double-edged sword. It is, uh, uh, so we have actually asked us about this one. So I mentioned earlier, people do change, right? So if you have that the personality traits or the one, if you can use that to detect people's change, that's why our work makes psychologists very excited about it is because before the instruments are very hard to use, they cannot easily get personality traits, especially large scale. So they stuck in this bubble of thinking about the personality traits never change. So actually that's not true. People's needs change. So which means that in this case, it's a good thing. So you don't get stuck in that one because if you, if you, the system identify the people actually changing and then you can give them a change in traits. You can give them a change that you can give them a different recommendations to fill in the changed traits. So another part of it is, as you said, what if you don't detect the changed traits? So that part of it is uh, maybe they have to kind of opt in other type of interaction data. And also, um, but, but this is why I'm asking myself it is, if that's the case, I have to ask the users, do they want to change? Do they want to see the items that do not uh, satisfy their needs? So that's a question to the users to answer. I think the different users may have a different answers. So I think I remember, I think maybe Lee, your paper on diversity, right? I think I remember you have a paper on diversity, which is based on the personality. You knew that uh, certain people with certain personality, they are much welcome, much, uh, um, uh, welcome the uh, uh, different types of recommendation, different diversity items, right? But certain people just don't. So in that case, do you want to force those people to change? So that's a philosophical issue. I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question is among the various personality model like Big Five, uh, bas um, basic uh, human values, needs, BMTI, and so on. Which one is most relevant for recommender systems in your view? I think in my view, and also based on the uh, uh, scientific studies, right? I would say the big five, it's the most basic, it's the most comprehensive one. Like values, the, like the human values, right? I think uh, probably people meant the Schwartz one. They actually, that the measures just the certain aspects of it. So the big five really measures uh, the person very comprehensively. And not just that, I wanted to actually caution people who are especially developed recommender systems based on personality traits. You wanted to base on the model that have been proven, they have actually effect on people's, they can predict people's important behavior. I didn't talk about in the, this talk, I talked about other talk before, so um, there's uh, numerous studies that show that uh, the big five personality can, can predict important uh, life outcomes like career success, marriage duration, or even lifespan. They have a proven results. So you want to opt for a model that has these proven results. You don't want to go to the model. They have very little empirical evidence to show that even just by survey-based items, they actually have any effect on user behavior, can predict user behavior. So I would say, because in recommender system, what do you do with this? It's to help people make real life choices, right? You're not making a, a laboratory or toy systems. You really influence people's choices. So in that case, I would say you want to go for a model that has a proven and the results showing that their measure can really predict people's behavior and influence people's choices. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question is, uh, uh, I can see some dangers in applying personality models in certain domains. For example, we could use them to make compulsive buyers buy more. What mechanism can we use to avoid such dangers? Compo fire? Com compulsive. Compulsive fire? Fire, fire. oh, fire. You mean the fire, you mean the fi like a, a fire somebody? Uh, make compul compulsive buyers buy more. We use personality to make compulsive buyers buy more. You mean the fi like, like the FIR, like a fire, like a like the in the HR domain? 
I think it's e-commerce domain. Oh, e-commerce. E-commerce. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the so this is a, this is also a very good question uh, as well. Instead, of, of course, uh, as I said uh, earlier, knowing a person so well, and especially sometimes uh, the system knows the person probably better than the person knows themselves. We often get actually users' comments like that. And in that case, and also the system is imperfect, right? So I cannot guarantee, we, nobody can guarantee that right now, the inferred personality is very, uh, it's a hundred percent accurate. How would you know the person, a, a, a person hundred percent? Nobody can vouch for that. So in that case, it is what I would say here, it is uh, the relative score becomes uh, uh, more important, which means it is you have to, Make the comparison, look at the scales, uh, not using uh, absolute scores. So not using the absolute scores of the inferred traits, but look at the relative, uh, uh, relative scores. So for example, when you make recommendations, uh, we would, uh, rec make recommendations of the products to different sets of people, you want to also look at the relative scores among the people as well. In this case, to avoid uh, actually drastic mistakes in that case. So I'm not sure I answered this question because I'm not familiar with this particular phrase. And then uh, maybe I, if I didn't answer this question, maybe I, uh, afterwards I can go take a look and then to answer it uh, in, uh, uh, in the chat, in the Q and A session with the chat. So what, basically what I'm talking about is uh, system can make mistakes and the humans can mistakes, which means that they look at this different uh, uh, scores. So take into consideration of the imperfections and also by looking at the relative scores, not just the absolute scores of the inferred traits. As the, as the basically remedy, as a precaution. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And do you have any example of customer personality traits being successfully used in e-commerce? Uh, in commerce. E-commerce. So I think the one we used, uh, I would say, semi-successfully because we didn't end up uh, doing a massive development uh, is the, a book uh, recommendation. So uh, we, uh, we basically, uh, I wouldn't think, I, uh, because we are not the commerce company, so uh, uh, we got the request, which I cannot disclose actually from whom, and uh, we got a request uh, to actually make a good book, book recommendations. So in that uh, particular uh, scenario, I would say we're semi-successful. It is the recommendations we made uh, to the people with about like uh, 15 minutes of a chat, one. And uh, the overall scores was also basically, again, the rate on our final recommendation results was um, uh, quite good, it's also around the 4.0, not as good as the gamers, but around like a 4.0. Okay. I think that's the closest example I can think about because it's also more people. I remember it's about uh, thousands of people. Yeah, but thousands of people, something like that. So um, I would say that's the closest to a real commerce one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, the time is up. So uh, there are still some questions. I think maybe we, we don't have time to invite Michelle to answer, but I think later maybe Michelle can answer in the uh, HUA uh, in this uh, uh, platform. Okay, so thank uh, Michelle again for your very insightful and interesting talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, for your invitation and for the introduction, yeah, for moderating the session as well. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.